Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our sixth webinar since this crisis started. It seems like it was forever ago since we were last under normal circumstances, but we're back here today, and I'm super excited that you're here today. We're going to be discussing from surviving to thriving, preparing and planning for your program's musical future. Today's webinar is going to be about an hour in length, and we have a ton of information to share. I have an absolute ton of information to share. So you're going to want to download the slide deck at joinsll.com. That's joinsll.com. From there, you'll be able to take notes. You'll be able to reflect upon what's being shared. But more important, you'll have a record to re go back to as we return back to school, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, preparing and planning for your return to school. Now, Understanding some things. We, in the previous webinars, we've discussed uh, some subject matter. We have so much to cover today that we won't be going over those content again. And we encourage you, if you're looking for a, a, a webinar on how to think different or the new COVID curricula, recruitment and retention, communication, your leadership selection, any of those content areas, those are available at joinsll.com. That's join, S I'm sorry, that's available at scottlang.net. That's scottlang.net. And this webinar will be posted for you to review there as well. But we won't be going back, just like we're looking forward to what happens when school reopens, we're gonna be looking forward today. So you have to understand that the COVID crisis presents not only a, a, a scenario that's damaging to music education, but it also presents an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to re-engineer parts of our profession and parts of our program in very meaningful ways. You know, every year as I watch marching bands, every year as I watch concert orchestras, every year as I watch drum corps, I'm constantly amazed at how they raise their level of, of excellence and how they raise their level of, of accomplishment and expectation. And I think, gosh, it just can't get any better than this. And then somehow next year it does. And it gets better because we find new and better ways to teach. We find ways to be not only more efficient, but more effective. And we can't handle what's be, we can't change what's being handed to us. The COVID crisis is here. The pandemic is altering what we do. But what we can do is alter our approach so that we make lemonades out of lemons. And that starts with number one, don't engage in a victim mentality. The COVID pandemic has victims people who are gone, families that are torn apart, and people who are on ventilators. It has victims of first responders and emergency aid workers who haven't been home in 64 days. Those are the victims. We are not victims. And if we engage in a victim mentality, then we're giving up the power to make a, a meaningful change, not only in our profession, but in ourselves. I was on a conference call yesterday uh, with a, a, a large organization, a company, and they were talking about, well, we're doing a cut and this and everything's bad and doom and gloom. And at the very end, and I think really it was out of courtesy, they asked, well, how are you doing, Scott? And I said, honestly, this has been such an amazing time for me because it's made me think differently than in my life. And it's made me approach not only my business, but music education in a way that I've never approached it. And it's really been incredibly refreshing for me. And I don't mean to make light of this terrible time, but it's challenged me at a time when I needed to be challenged. And so we are not victims here. This pandemic has victims to be sure, but we are not one of them. The last thing I want to share with you is this. Take advantage of the moment or the moment will take advantage of you. That these next 45 days are kind of going to come and go and school is going to reopen. And if we don't seize this moment, this time to reflect, this time to be away from our buildings and away from our students to think, we may never get this again in our career. You know, this is truly an opportunity for us to move our programs forward. And the title wasn't an accident. People who just tread water, professionals, teachers, programs, who just tread water now will come back and they will survive. We will survive. Music education is the cockroach of the world. We will survive this, I guarantee you. But those who are proactive, those who are aggressive, those who reach for the future and make meaningful changes will do more than survive. They're gonna thrive. 
take advantage of this program or it'll take advantage of you. Now understand that this webinar is really to get you to start thinking about possible scenarios and the obstacles and opportunities that we're going to face. This is going to look different for an elementary school than it is a high school. It's going to look different for a choir than it is for an orchestra. It's going to look different for a middle school band than it is for a high school chamber ensemble. I'm here to share information and get you to think through processes. And what I want you to do is think through how do I apply them in real time to my specific situation, whether it's rural or inner city, whether it's affluent or it's not, whether it's um, it's it's a high school or middle school. It's up to you to come up with that application process while we present the very different scenarios. So as we know, as we think about that, I want you to think through these possible things. My computer is freezing. There we go. Number one, there are three possible contingencies. Number one, There'll be minimal change in the in program. Schools will return in August. You may have some uh, dis social distancing procedures and protocols in place, but everything will open up pretty much as it is. Option number two is that when we reopen, there will be impact to your program. Your late summer activities might be altered or canceled. Your enrollment might be significantly impacted. Your budget might be affected and or your rehearsal schedule might be changed. And then the third more drastic draconian possibility is that changes to your program will be significant, that we won't start in the fall. Uh, there will be no football, i.e. marching band, that you will only see your students on Mondays and Thursdays or at all, or that we'll go to an alternated schedule where you get every other student every third day. There are three possible contingencies as I look forward to the future. And our goal today is to consider all three. And as we approach the, the plan of action that we're about to see, that we have a, a, a minimal impact plan, we have a medium impact plan, and we have a maximum impact plan. But the word that occurs in every one of those sentences is plan. We have to have a plan. And that's what we're here to do today. So as a part of that plan, we want to think about a couple of things. Number one, Failing to pretend, pretend, plan for the contingencies makes you more vulnerable to the decision-making of others. Number two, no matter what comes down the pike, we will adopt an I'll make it work attitude. Oh, you can only see your kids every third day. I'll make it work. Oh, there's not gonna be a trip in the fall. I'll make it work. Oh, you're gonna have to do social distancing and you can't have 70 kids in a room anymore. I'll make it work. Everything that comes our way, we don't have that choice to alter it. So we have, the only choice we have is to say, I'll make it work. And we have to adopt it the way that we would with our students. And the last one that said there was, be prepared to play chess. And when I say be prepared to play chess, and, and I'm not good at this in chess for certain, is be prepared to think four steps down the road. So that if they say, we have to practice social distancing, you can't have a marching band of 80. Well, my next question would be, okay, what about passing periods? What about the lunchroom? If I have a 1400 square foot rehearsal room and there's 100 kids, that's 14 square feet per child. Does that qualify? An English classroom's 240 square feet and they have 20 kids in there and that's um, eight feet per child. So how are we addressing that? We wanna always be thinking four moves down the road of whatever that impact might be. Don't think of just the immediate obstacle, but think of the obstacles three steps down. My hallway is only eight feet wide. Does that mean I'm only gonna let students out staggered every four minutes? My doorway, there's only one entrance. How do I address that issue? Uh, it, health and safety, we need things to be clean. What does that mean for sheet music? What does it mean for mallets? What does it mean? Always be thinking four steps down the road. Now the plan that we're gonna talk about today is a four step plan. Health and safety, financial planning, instructional design, and the student experience. Health and safety, financial planning, instructional design, and the student experience. Understand these are in a specific order for a specific reason, and you are welcome uh, to, uh, to approach it in a very different way, but this is the way my mind thinks through this, is I want to take care of health and safety first. Then I have to plan my finances so that I can provide for the instruction. Then I wanna design the instruction, and at the end I wanna make sure that the student experience hasn't been compromised as a part of that instruction. So we're gonna start with just that. We're gonna start with health and safety. So with health and safety, we need to be flexible, informed, and mindful. 
flexible, informed, and mindful. We have to be willing to adjust what we need to do and how we do it so that our students are safe. We have to be informed on the best practices so that we have correct information and we're not making things up and mindful. You know, we just talked about playing chess and I started thinking about, well, at the end of rehearsal, I give my announcements. Oh, wait a minute. All the kids gather around for announcements. I can't do that anymore. I got to use a whiteboard. I'll do it via text. I'll send out an email. I'll do a video announcement and text it to the kids. That we have to just constantly be thinking of, of how we do things and mindful of the way that we do them to ensure that our students are safe. And remember that in the end, you know, that these are kids and they're entrusted to our care and that no one's gonna remember our rating. No one's gonna remember the score we got or the trophy we run if someone we know and love is on a respirator. That's a chilling perspective for me. And you know, I'm about as competitive as, as they come uh, in all things that I do. It's just, it's in my DNA. And my shaken to the core moment was about three weeks ago when I was sitting there and someone had, uh, you know, I read on the news or I saw on a broadcast that once you've got COVID, you're isolated, no visitors. And I thought about my, my young son who doesn't even want his mom in the next room. He wants to be next to her all the time and sleep with her and <sighs> things. And it was just crazy to me when I thought that he could be in a hospital for four weeks alone without his mom, without his dad. And that was my perspective moment of, okay, Scott, whatever you've got to do to make sure that he's safe, that's what you do because that's an unthinkable thing. So be mindful, be flexible, and be informed. And remember that these are kids and they're trusted to our care and no one's gonna remember the trophy when someone's on a respirator. So for health and safety, here we go. This is real content for real solutions in real time. Um, you wanna, before you come back, think about having an instrument cleaning party, have stations and equipment and materials so that students can clean not only all of their, uh, um, all of their, um, their equipment and the band's equipment, but their own personal equipment. And that includes mallets, timpani, all the things that are touched by everyone. I would personally appoint a safety officer for every class, someone whose only job was to be mindful of that and say, Mr. Lang, uh, we can't do that, that's not safe. Mr. Lang, you forgot that you, everyone's, that, the things I'm not good at, I always asked a student to check me on. Um, so why would safety be any different? I'm not thinking about safety, I'm thinking about balance and blend. So I need someone whose job it is to think about safety. Um, you wanna involve the chaperones and the boosters and the leaders in monitoring and implementing and thinking through three steps ahead. How do we hand out uniforms? How do we do general music equipment when it's changed every hour on the hour by different kids? Who wipes down the seats? Do we have to wipe down the stands? Did anybody touch them? Those are the things we wanna be thinking through and the more minds that you have engaging in the thought process and the more minds you have engaging in the actual action of safety, the more effective and efficient you're going to be. Um, health and safety is also an emotional issue and it's a mental health issue. Uh, so we're not just talking about germs here. We're not just talking about COVID, the bacteria. We're talking about people who've been isolated for weeks and weeks and weeks. We're talking about students whose parents are unemployed. We're talking about students who've been traumatized through this and adults who've been traumatized through this, who miss their friends. So you want to also be cognizant and caring and empathetic and looking for students who are struggling, not just musically, not just academically, but students who are struggling emotionally. And then most of all, you want to model for your students what you expect to see out of them. You want to do it from a health and safety perspective, but you want to do it from a human perspective. Uh, try and be a little more patient. Try and be a little more em empathetic and try and be a little more mindful of who they are and what they've been through and what this COVID pandemic has brought to the table and how we can keep, how we can keep our students safe. So one of the things you want to think about is um, creating an actual pragmatic list. What is the equipment we have? What are the materials that we're responsible for? Everything from the mallets and the mutes that we use to the music we touch. You know, the instruments is the obvious thing. What about the door handles? What about the light switches? What about uh, the music in and of itself? That you want to think through that and think through what it would take to baseline clean it so we're safe coming back, but what it would take to clean and maintain it throughout the season. You want to encourage all students uh, while they're at home to clean their own instruments using proper protocol. Um, I believe Con Summer released um, some videos that they cleared with the CDC 
um, yesterday. So I think Con Selmer is a great resource and I'm sure they're not the only ones who have released those resources, but you can share those with your students and especially with brass instruments. Those are things that they can do at home. But my understanding is that um, the bacteria can only live for up to seven days. So instruments that are actually stored at school uh, are not getting played, but they are actually safe because the germs can't live beyond the life cycle of what they're stored there. But once again, please check more reputable sources and places than my brain. Try the Con Summer website, and we will be sharing some of those as well and be part of the music. Um, once you've thought through equipment, you want to think through facilities. Um, practice rooms, uniform rooms, uh, dorm rooms, if you go on camp or go on a trip, hotel rooms. You want to think about shared gathering spaces, hallways, places where kids congregate, restrooms, and think through how do we maintain social distancing if we need to maintain social distancing. Um, doorways, entryways, um, buses, the stands at a, at a, at a game, uh, playing circles for general music, start to think through those and prepare a contingency plan for, again, remember, minimal invasive uh, uh, activity, medium invasive activity, and significant invasive activities. Uh, you then need to think about your classes and think of all the classes and impact that they would have. Maybe the wind ensemble, need, or you need to go from a concert band of uh, 75 down to a wind ensemble of 35 because that's the only way to do social distancing. Maybe you go to a heterogeneous versus homogeneous setup or homogeneous versus heterogeneous. I see woodwinds one day, brass another. Maybe you split it by age and grouping. Remember, we adapt the can-do attitude. When my administrator comes to me and says, this is what's safe for kids, I will make it work. I will think through the steps, I will process, and I will make it work because nothing is more important than kids' safety and your safety. You may have kids and you certainly have loved ones who want you to come home through. So think through your classes. And actually this could be a really cool way to do some cool stuff with woodwind chambers or brass chamber ensembles or small ensembles or honor ensembles or wind ensemble versus symphonic band or jazz bands. And they, I mean, if you are creative, you can turn a negative into a positive. And if you are creative, you can do things in a real meaningful way uh, that doesn't water down the student's experience, but also maintains that they're going to be uh, healthy and safe. And for me, you know, that's got to be the, the top priority. So health and safety, step number one. This is something you want to be addressing, thinking, preparing, and planning for right now. Think through all the contingencies and play chess. Think four steps ahead. After we address health and safety, the next thing we want to think about is financial planning. What is the budget going to look like? What are the finances going to look like? And what's going to be the impact uh, on this thing? So we're going to start with two different layers. Number one, short-term financial planning. So what I would do is I would prepare, and if this is redundant, you already do this, and good, that's fantastic. But we want to make sure we're, we're giving everyone all the tools they need. Put everything uh, you have to do with finance on a single spreadsheet. That includes the past fiscal year and this upcoming fiscal year, so that you can do a year over year comparison. You also wanna have subsets for the, the trips. So big ticket items, band camp, trips, those sorts of things, so that you know on a trip, what are we spending on buses? What are we spending on hotels? What are we spending on meals? For your year over year, what am I spending on staffing? What am I spending on instrument repair? What am I spending on on meals? What am I spending on M&O? What am I spending on music? What am I spending on repairs? The point being so that when and if there comes a time when you have to trim off the budget, you have a very quick and efficient way to prioritize those because what you're going to do is you're then going to break them down into what are things that are likely to change and what are things that are likely to stay the same. So I have my budget now. Well, class fees are already set. It's a district protocol and policy. Those are probably going to stay the same where my band fee, my orchestra fee, my trip fee may have to take a significant change because parents may be out of work or we may cut the trip back. So that what you're gonna to wanna to do is determine what's likely not to change and what is likely to change. Then I would sit down with my boosters and I would call it the Holy Trinity, Holy Trinity Financial Planning. I would look at the band budget that you just created. I would look at the booster budget that was just created and I would look at my school budget. And I would start to look at them in a very holistic way so that what is our total budget and that if I needed to take a cut, let's say in, in an area of instrument uh, repair or maintenance, 
Could the boosters pick that up? Is there a school fund that I could slide that over? If I had to cut from one pie, is there another part of the pie that I could use to cover that? So first, you want to put your budget on a, on a spreadsheet. Second, you want to make sure that you break it down into the bigger subsets. Third, you want to determine what is likely to change and what is not likely to change. Fourth, you want to sit down with your boosters and create the holy trinity of the budgeting process. Fifth, and this is a biggie, you're going to assign each category into three categories, health and safety, operational, and instruction. Okay, health and safety. What are the budget items I need to cover to make sure my students are healthy and safe? And that can be even walkie talkies for band camp. It may be more chaperones. It may be cleaning supplies. It may be a larger instrument repair budget. Operational. What does it take to get to a football game? How many buses? Am I going to have to have more buses? Social distancing? One to a seat? What's that going to look like? What are my operational costs? Uh, music, repair, instruments. And then instructional. And that typically is arrangements, drill, new equipment, and staff that helps teach. So you've got your budget. Then you, you determine what's going to stay and what might change. You create the holy trinity. Then you assign expenditures into one of those categories. Health and safety, operational, and structural, and experiential. And experiential are things like team bonding and activities. And then, last but not least, you're going to prioritize them. One, two, three, a priority one is I don't want to cut this unless the sky is falling. Priority two is I prefer to keep it, but it's open for discussion. And priority three is it can be cut without much impact to the students. Spreadsheet, determine what's likely to change, what's likely to stop. <laughs> Create the holy trinity of budgeting with your boosters. Assign into categories, health and safety, operational, instructional, and experiential, and then give them a priority level. Priority one, priority two, priority three. Now you've created the infrastructure to make decisions, make them quickly and make them efficiently in the best interest of kids. Now you wanna look at some more philosophical approaches to financial planning. You wanna be sensible, uh, sensitive and mindful of all decisions that you make because to be honest with you, your parents are gonna be impacted. And you wanna make sure that uh, you understand that there are going to be a significant amount of people out of work and they want you to be mindful of that and not put them into a situation in which they they can't participate because of money we want to create an <laughs> and if you could help us out there, you want to create and maintain ongoing list of and you want to create an ongoing list of equipment and inventory that would allow you to project three and five years in advance. Uh, it's important that you have that so that you can talk to your administration and your district about what it would take to move down that line so that maybe we need an extra tuba every year so we can get to where every kid is not sharing a tuba. We want to get to a position that we ensure that um, we've got a three to five year plan where we can address every need that we have so that every student can, can be health and safety. We want to do the same thing with our m and budget. And then we want to sit down with our admin team, our department chairs in our district and create a plan. And that plan may look very different depending on your school, your community, your booster structure, and your age group. Uh, it may be a PTO for an elementary school. It may be a booster group for a high school orchestra. Um, and you want to focus on maintaining your top two priority levels, priority level one and priority level two, so that you can maintain the, infra the infrastructure for your students to be successful, not only as people, but successful as musicians. Um, Priority threes are the first that we look at. And then focus on the cuts that will not impact the student's quality of instruction. And then last but not least, and this is something I was actually able to do my last year teaching. It took me four years, but I was able to develop a fund where if something like COVID ever hit, I had enough money I could operate my band program for an entire year without any money. Um, I saved about 20% of my uh, fees and budgeting 
uh, so that at the end of four years, four and a half years, I literally could operate my bank program for an entire time uh, without any function, without any uh, funds whatsoever. So I encourage you to take that approach to start developing uh, a fund with not just your monies, but with your booster monies so that you can withstand a hit like this and survive an entire year without being impacted or affected. And that will take a few period of time. So uh, uh, two to three to four to five years. Next, we wanna talk about instructional design. Now, if you don't adapt to the current circumstances, then you're setting your students up for failure. It's just that simple. Um, I, when I went, I was an administrator for a year. And after that year, um, I went to a new school and the new school adopted a block schedule. And I knew about it going in and I adjusted and tweaked some things, but um, I didn't foresee some things. I didn't foresee that a concert might occur on a day I didn't see the students. I didn't foresee things like announcements. Kids don't remember two days later. I didn't foresee things like if there's a pep assembly and we meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then I would go Monday, Wednesday, not see them till the following Monday. And attendance and absences drove me crazy because it was a wind ensemble for the top group meant one to a part. And if someone missed because of a test, missed because they were sick, I had no rehearsal. And so at the end of the year, I'm like, okay, we got to gut this and we've got to redesign this band program for the circumstances I'm facing. And I went to a, a, a full symphonic band where I had two to a part. So if someone was absent, it didn't hurt. I went to a situation where I planned the concerts on days where I had the block day. So I had two hours of band, then I had the concert that night and it gave me an hour of setup. I did announcements via the whiteboard and via text so that I was sure that the days I didn't see the kids. And the point is, if you don't change the way you're doing it, not only are you setting your kids up for failure, but you're missing maybe the opportunity of a lifetime to be the best teacher that you can be. Don't let the situation play you. You play the situation. So instructional design. Very first thing, I would meet with your staff. Um, control the narrative, communicate with one voice and one tone. You tell your staff, and, and if you don't have a staff, maybe it's your private lesson teachers, your boosters, your assistant, maybe it's, you know, uh, you're telling your sixth grade teachers when you come in, this is what my narrative. The point is, you speak with one voice, one tone, and one message. This is the way we're going to approach this. If your approach is, we're gonna, we're gonna make some adjustments and we're gonna do instead of 80 pages of drill, 70, and it's gonna be awesome because we're gonna be the cleanest we've ever been. And one member of your staff goes, well, this stinks. God, we're not, he told me I had to water down the drum book. Well then you're undermining your creativity, your credibility, and that's gonna spread like a cancer through your organization. Your staff has to be on your page and you set that, you communicate with one voice, one message and one tone, a tone of joy. Get a framework of understanding of um, where you've been and what you can do, what you can achieve and be realistic. If you think that uh, kids are gonna come back and play the way they played when they left you in March, that's unrealistic. Now it doesn't mean you can't achieve everything that you want to achieve, but you have to be realistic about how you're gonna do that. Select literature, choreography, and parts that allows for success. Watering up is easier than watering down. Watering up, taking easy things and making harder. If you do 70 pages of drill, and pardon me for using a high school analogy, do 50 next year. And then if they get it down, add choreography, you'll make it harder. Add impact, cut the amount of counts, add more musical demand. It's easier to make things harder, it's a lot harder to make things easier. And that was one of the things on my block schedule. I went from playing grade five and a half music to grade five or even four and a half because I was so stressed and frustrated with our level of achievement. And I realized, well, that's my fault. I picked out the music. You would never pick out Flight of the Bumblebee and hand it to a beginning dance student, would you? That would be stupid. That would be setting that kid up for failure, setting them up for frustration, setting them up for them to not enjoy the experience and quit. It's no different here. If you try and do 110 pages of drill and your rehearsal time's been cut in half, then you're setting them up for failure and you're setting them up for frustration and you're setting them up to have a bad experience. And that was the choice you made. That was the choice you made. Meet with your staff and design and modify the objectives and create contingency plans. What happens if? What do we do if? If we can't get this, how do we respond with this? If we don't get camp, how do we modify this? 
If we get camp and it's shorter, what do we do? Meet as a team and bounce off each other. Um, push when other teachers pull, pull when other teachers push. So I know that uh, before school and the first week of school, every teacher is going to be Captain Fluffy because we're so happy to see you and we're going to review what you missed. So I'm going to drive my band into the ground. We are going to rehearse, 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 rehearse. So I'm going to push them. We're going to do morning rehearsals, afternoon rehearsals, night. I'm going to push, baby, because I know every other teacher is pulling back. And then come finals, come midterms, I'm going to pull back. I'm going to say, no sectionals this week, kids. You need to focus on getting your grades right. Hey, kids, uh, we're going to study hall this period because I know you have a big project due tomorrow. That know what the students are going through and be sensitive to that. Push when other teachers are pulling. And that's typically before school begins and during the first week of school, maybe the first two, and then pull when other teachers are pushing. Uh, look at ways uh, that you have to set up uh, and alter your functionality uh, as a staff. You know, maybe we can't do a warm-up circle. Maybe the warm-up circle's got to be wider. Maybe uh, we can't be with seventh graders as one. It's too many kids. We've got to spread them out and do seventh grade brass, seventh grade woodwinds. And then use online assessment to get the kids um, ahead of where they should be. Start to look at Zoom, smart music, charms, video chat, online lessons, so that students walk in the door as prepared as possible. But don't forget, you, repeat, you are responsible for designing student excess, success. In the end, it is our job. It is my responsibility to make my students successful. And it doesn't mean every student will be successful every time, but it means I need to plan for it and design for it. So here's some day-to-day -day things for students now that we've talked about staff. Number one, challenge students to rise up and reframe what success might look like. Um, It's not Pearl Harbor. It's not 9-11. It wasn't a bus accident in which seven students were hurt. It's COVID. Maybe our rehearsal time's cut back. We miss seeing each other. But reframe the conversation and reframe what success might look like. And many of you have been through traumatic events in which you say, gosh, music takes a back seat right now. We lost an orchestra student to, to suicide. Music takes a back seat right now. There's a tragic event in our community. You know, for me, you know, 9-11. Uh, reframe this for your students. Take the lead as an instructor, as a teacher, and reframe not only the situation, but what success looks like. Deliver hard news early, directly, and be upfront. And know that tone is important. Guys, it's day one. Here's the deal. Um, we're not going to be able to take our fall trip it's a bummer and I'm as frustrated and bummed up as you, but I guarantee you, I'm going to make it up to you. We're going to have the best year ever. I've already got a plan. We're going to do a sleepover. We're going to commission a work. We're going to do this. We're going to that not only deliver the news kindly, directly and early on, but then followed up with energy, enthusiasm and excitement. And you've all had these circumstances. I've had a trip canceled due to unforeseen circumstances and we made the best of it. We did sleepovers in the band room and we, we did other activities that, that made it special, even though we didn't get on a plane. Um, I had a camp in which was, uh, was uh, redesigned and we had to do it not in the camp, but in teepees and it rained the entire time. And honestly, it was one of the best trips we ever had together uh, because we got through it together. Uh, it's your job to not only deliver the information directly and honestly and kindly, but then set the tone moving forward. That it's going to be great. We're going to have the best orchestra ever. I've got an idea about we're going to bring in a composer. We're going to do something even better than a trip and you know, so on and so forth. Um, and this is the next one. It's huge. Focus your, your time on ensemble work. Student work should happen outside of rehearsal. And, and so like there are a lot of these people doing virtual ensembles. It's so cool. Do it with next year's opener. They should come to school with all three tunes learned. Think about the amount of time that'll save you. If a kid using smart music, using Zoom, using buddy system, using online lessons, using MIDI files, using uh, virtual ensembles. If kids walked in the door on August 1st and could, could play everything you want to play in your concert with your orchestra in October, you would be ahead of the game. COVID would have been an advantage to you. Everything you do, they're sitting at home. Figure out a way to get as much individual work done 
outside of your rehearsal process. You're not talking about F sharps and Boeings and B flats. And you're talking about ensemble articulation, phrasing, blend, balance. Um, gamify this to build momentum. First one to post a, a 90 or above gets a Zoom, a Zoom high five. Um, first section that memorizes the opener gets an ice cream sandwich delivered to you by me personally. The first trumpet, uh, the first section that, that memorizes the ballad, I, the, I will be their slave for rehearsal. I will march their drill spot. I will wear a t-shirt that says violins rule. Gamify it. Pit section against section. Pit, pit, um, you know, seniors against freshmen. Pit, you, it's, it's endless, but gamify it. But the, uh, the end goal is, again, if you use Zoom and smart music and charms, that if you use them to, in, in assessment and accountability and you gamify it, you could actually be ahead of the game. You could turn that frown upside down into a smile when you, you have now saved 30 hours of work when the students come back. Um, on the smaller picture, find a way to shave five to seven minutes off every rehearsal. We've got to take attendance to it outside rehearsal. You just picked up two minutes. Uh, I'm going to do announcements. I'll text them. I just picked up one minute. Um, kids, you're going to you're going to learn drill at your home and come with the, your drill spot memorized. I just picked up three minutes. Just memorize the coordinates for your first two pages. Um, kids, um, I'm not going to talk about X, Y, or Z. Um, I'm going to send it in a text. I just picked up. Three. If you pick up three to five to seven minutes every day over a period of a season, you've picked up two weeks of rehearsal. And you've actually gained time. You've actually gained time from what you may have lost. And front load the individual work as much as possible. I mentioned the, the virtual ensemble team. And then the last two things is use your leadership team and peer partnering to facilitate this. So if you have, you know, a, a clarinet section of 10, pair them up and have them teach each other. Um, do online lessons. If, use your section leader to, for accountability. Use your section leader to take care of things. Use your section leaders or, or next door neighbors or seniors. Engage the masses in peer mentoring and actually might build bonding and might make your ensemble even tighter. But again, obviously contributes to the instructional process. You could even create mini ensembles. Um, you could create mini clarinets, mini, uh, mini crossbreeds. So a brass ensemble, a woodwind ensemble, a clarinet ensemble, two clarinets, two flutes, two saxes, two trumpets, two horns, two, you know, Noah's Ark. We'll call that ensemble. Just made that up. And create mini ensembles that literally the limits are, are only what your imagination is. But if you design it correctly, I genuinely believe, I genuinely believe you can actually be more efficient than you've ever been. You can accomplish more than you've ever accomplished and you will be a better orchestra, band, choir, general music class than you've ever been. Use this moment to clear the mind, clear the slate and rebuild it from scratch. Don't let this be an excuse to accept mediocrity. I don't know that the level of music teaches my kids as much as being musical. So when I had to go from a grade five and a half to a grade five or four and a half or whatever it is, my students were probably getting a better music education because I was focusing on creativity and musicianship and ensemble techniques and stuff. Did you get the B flat clarinets? Can you play that run? It's forked fingerings, B flat, B, B flat, B saxes. That that doesn't make them, you know, more human. That makes them better technicians. So if you do this, it's not an excuse. If you have to scale back drill or music or what you're demanding, it's not necessarily accepting mediocrity. It's elevating the experience that you have. Let it challenge you to be an even better teacher and be willing to play Tetris. I can only have four kids every 32 minutes. Okay, I'll slide them here. Oh, I, I get all of them here on this day. Okay, I'm going to slide them there that you give me the slot. Oh, I can have all my kids, but I don't get the stadium. Okay, I'll do this. You know, and the thing, um, you know, I, I was sh uh, sharing with Wendy Higdon, uh, shout out to Wendy, who's just a brilliant middle school teacher um, in Carmel, Indiana. She helps me think through things, make sure I'm not, I, that my blind spots are covered. Um, we were talking yesterday and uh, it was really interesting because you know, she talked about how she's doing recruitment and retention differently. And it, it forced her to ask kids questions she'd never thought to ask. Like, do you like to hold an instrument or do you like to have it sit on the ground? Do you like things that make high sounds or, you know, and it was really, it was really interesting. 
um, to think through like, well, what does that look like and how is it different? And even if things go back to normal, how can we make it feel and be even better than it was before? Be willing, be flexible to play Tetris with your ensembles. Student experience. This is a, kind of the last section I've talked about. And this is how students feel about their group. The student experience starts with tone and intent. If you are upset and frustrated and angry, then they're gonna be those things. And if you are calm and joyful and optimistic and hopeful, the students will be those things. Well, we didn't get to go on a trip. They will still be, be joyful and happy if you are joyful and happy. But if you're carrying it around like a 10 pound weight on your shoulder, then they're gonna tear it, carry it around like a 10 pound weight on their shoulder. The student experience starts with your tone and intent. Student experiences aren't based on a singular event or activity. Well, we didn't get to go on the trip, so there goes this year. No. Well, we can't have band camp away from school. This year is going to stink. No. Well, we don't, get to, we don't get to go to the big competition in Utah. No. Well, my classes aren't going to be able to meet every day. No. There is no singular event activity that determines what, the, what the, the student experience is. It's a daily immersion into the approach that we take. It's a daily immersion into the approach that we take and that starts with your tone and your intent. Bonding doesn't require a trip or location. You know, and uh, the thing I, I say, and it's a, a marching band phrase, is band camp is not a date on the calendar or a geographic location. It's a state of mind. You know, people say, well, God, it's just not the same as when we were at band camp. And I say, was that, are you marching on the same field? Yeah. Is it the same kids? Yeah. Okay, you're playing the same music? Yeah. Well, then the reason they were happy was their approach. They were excited to be there, excited to meet new people, excited to play get to know your games, excited to do something they haven't done in a while. That's a frame of mind. It's not a date on the calendar and it's not a geographic location that your students experience isn't, isn't predicated on a trip that you're going to take, a place you're going to go, a piece of music that you're going to play. You know, no one ever comes back and says, oh, Mr. Lang, Mr. Lang, it was that trip to San Francisco that I remember the most. It, it, it was that, God, you gave me a safe place to, to eat lunch and you pushed me and you cared about me and you asked about me. It's, it's not tied to an event. And if you allow it to be, then you're allowing the control to be taken from you of the way your students feel and how they, they, they think about your, your group in this activity. The student experience starts with your tone and intent. So a couple things, whoops, I went too far back. Work with the student leaders to determine what experiences are critical uh, to maintaining what aren't. Uh, when I went to that new school, I sat down with the drum majors. I said, give me five things. If I, if I, if I change them, you're going to hang me from a tree and give me five things you want me to change. And it wasn't that I did or didn't change all, not of them, but it gave me an idea really quickly of what was sacred power. It gave me an understanding really quickly of what was important to the students and what things I didn't want to touch and what things I, I was able to touch without any impact. Second thing you want to do is provide perspective for your seniors. Acknowledge the pain they've been through and provide perspective. Listen, nobody died here, guys. My senior year is ruined. No, it's not. Only if you allow it to be ruined. You're only going to get one crack at a senior year. So you can choose for it to be ruined or you can choose for it to be joyful. It's your choice. Acknowledge the loss and inspire them to find something good inside of it. Um, determine what needs need to be reconfigured and re-engineered to meet those experiences. So it's our candlelight ceremony, okay? I know I can't touch that. That's great. It's in a really small room and it's for a long period of time. So how do I do that? How do I fix it? How do I re-engineer it? How do I reconfigure it to make it where I know I've got to keep it? They've told me. Now I got to be creative about how I do it. Since we're not going to a physical band camp away, but we usually require it. And it's usually till 11 o'clock at night. How do we do that? Do I just turn off all the lights in the band room and do it after dinner? What? Figure it out. Um, and then challenge your students to create new and meaningful experiences and give them the budget to do it. You know, I, I said, um, 
uh, I was talking to uh, uh, um, the CEO uh, of Alfred, Ron Manis, who is just one of the most decent, kind, funny, amazing human beings uh, you'll ever meet. And he said, you know, no one's talking about Scott. And I said, what, Ron? He goes, no one's talking about all the money we're saving right now. I said, what do you mean? He goes, we're not going to NAM. That saved us, you know, a ton of money. We're not going to state conventions. That saved us a ton of money. We're not doing a print materials online. That saved us a ton of money. He goes, yes, we're not selling anything, but we're not spending anything. You know, that you're not going on a trip. Well, if you, that saved you a ton of money. You can allocate a budget to a banquet. You know, if your band fee went from 600 bucks because you were going on a trip to 100 that it takes to run your organization, make your band fee 140 they're still gonna be happy to drop from 600 to 140 and it gives you a $40 slash fund per student to do something really cool and fun for them. Um, calendar them and budget them. Put them on the date. Every two weeks, I'm gonna do something special. I'm gonna give 20 minutes to class and I'm gonna assign a student to be in charge of it. I learned that because my, my drum major is like, Mr. Lang, you're really good at bonding, but you don't do it in October. I'm like, dude, we got competitions. I am teaching. And they said, but we really miss it. So I said, all right, put it on the calendar the first month, the first and third Monday of October. I will come up with it, but you got to put it on the calendar and hold my feet to the fire that I give 20 minutes to do something special. And I, because I knew I would get lost in band director mode and I would, I would not see the forest for the trees and that they would help remind me. Um, reach out to peers. Uh, for their ideas and activities and work with their local directors to come up with special things to do every Friday night when you see another band. Maybe, maybe do a joint concert with another orchestra. Maybe Skype with another elementary school in Asia that's doing general music. But connect with other people so that they see the celebrations in everyday activities and everyday performances. Um, and uh, allocate that time and that resource and that human capital and to that experiential activities and then hold yourself a counter a counter to them because you are responsible for that and it doesn't mean you have to do it it just means you have to you have to provide for those things that that make music special and that make us different than every other organization and it's a challenge but who who better is prepared to improv than a music teacher you know, this isn't English or math where their curriculum might be set in stone and I taught the same Beowulf last year, so I know what to do. You're used to having new music each and every nine weeks. You're used to having new kids each and every year that are learning different. You're used to having to raise the bar to be competitively, um, competitively relevant every year. You're used to teaching improv. You're used to not being able to control the events and making, making a bad moment good and turning a frown upside down and making lemonade out of Nobody, there is no teacher on the campus that's better prepared for this moment than a music teacher. There's probably no teacher on campus that has greater obstacles but there's no teacher on campus that's better prepared for this moment than you. And you, you are responsible for designing student success. So some real quick ideas. Um, so find a service cause, challenge the kids to raise money. Uh, when we did the Rose Bowl, uh, my band, we turned into a marchathon. We gave the money to muscular dystrophy uh, for kids who couldn't march, kids who couldn't walk. We turned an event into a cause and it was such a cool event. It was so cool um, to do that. Uh, you could commission a piece, um, uh, get a consortium. If they, you know, get 10 schools, hire a composer and commission a piece. And that's, I've done that. It's a super cool year long thing that makes it special. And it, it adds to their legacy. Um, he, near, Heroes Near and Far came from a project. It was an integrated thematic instruction project I did on Heroes. And it was a nine week uh, integrated in, the Mac instructional process in which kids wrote things and they created artistic representations, art. They had to do art. Um, they researched with a guidance counselor uh, about uh, uh, the careers that, that would inspire them. They had to create an academic plan for graduation. They had to write to a hero and try and get a letter back. I mean, it was a nine week incredible event. We did, we ended, we did um, a movement for Rosa with my, each piece had narrators and we invited our administrators in and it ended with a movement for Rosa and Rosa Parks was scheduled to come to the concert. Um, and nine, uh, about three weeks before the concert, she was involved in an accident and couldn't get on the plane and make it. But we took the letters we got back from senators and congressmen and the president of the United States personal secretary. I got that far. I got to his, his front door. It took me a long time, um, but I couldn't get to the president. She said, I can't, I can't do that for you. But what I can do is, 
draw you a letter and let your students know how hard you work to get to your hero. And, um, and we blew them up into big posters and put them around the wall and did a big community concert. The reason I share that with you is I will tell you hands down, it's the most memorable thing I've done in my 15 years of teaching. It wasn't the Rose Bowl, it wasn't, uh, we played for the president, it wasn't, and I'm not name dropping, please understand, but we've done, I've done some cool stuff. I've been very fortunate in my life. And um, it's all a distant second to uh, the, um, the a concert of heroes is what we called it. In fact, the, the program is up over my right shoulder. This, I don't know if it's left to you, uh, with the John F. Kennedy looking down, that's the concert program uh, from that event. Um, adopt a nursing home, teach a leadership unit, do a concert for essential workers, first responders, healthcare professionals, um, allocate uh, time to section leaders to do something, nuts and bolts, good deed beads, happy file activities. Those are all activities that I would put in my rotation to make students feel special. And my opus, if you're a fan of uh, Bloom County, he's got all the nuts from, um, that were given to me as a part of my nut and bolt activity. Happy file is basically a time capsule of things that makes kids happy. Um, it, there are all sorts of crazy things you can do. And in the chat box, I'd like you to add your own ideas right now so that everybody can learn from you. Um, create a pinning ceremony, letter ceremony, induction ceremony. I never had an induction ceremony in the band, but I think I'd create one now if I, because I want those kids bought in from day one. I'd do an induction ceremony. Um, pins, you, know, you are especially good rehearser today. Here's a buff band pin. Boom, they're like a buck a pin. Um, uh, you know, uh, a, a, do a letter ceremony, do, do a banquet, do, a, do something that, that facilitates kids feel like they're a part of something. And not just what I've always done, create something new and create, invite alumnus, community members, politicians to come speak about the group, about how special this is. Um, I used to, the very first day of band camp, I, my, where I taught most of my career, uh, um, uh, um, the school was uh, in 1912 was when they opened it. And I would spend an hour every day, the very first, and I would walk through the entire trophy cabinet. And I had it broken down into legacy trophies, you know, things from the 1940s, um, trophies from the last uh, five years, um, trophies, I call it the, the, the honor case, things that would never come down. That group had performed at Midwest. I, I wasn't the conductor, Steve Peterson was. Uh, the Rose Bowl, um, the presidential concert, things that were sacred to that group. And I would teach the kids about the history of that program. And so they felt like, God, I'm, I'm a part of something special, something that's been around a hundred years and will be around another hundred years. Um, you know, the, but you're in charge of creating that experience. It doesn't create itself. And if you're not a super creative person, some people aren't in, 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 in that, uh, that you can learn from other people from these ideas or from chat box or go buy a book at Barnes and Noble, but there's lots of different things that you can do. Know that we can't control what happened to us, but only how we respond. And that the victim mentality only serves like how we put on there instead of only, didn't catch that typo. The victim, see, I'm a clown show on certain days. The victim mentality only serves to make you the victim. The victim mentality only serves to make you the victim. The only victims here are people who are gone, family members who lost them, and people on respirators. And if you're not one of them, you're not a victim. You're not a victim. Few teachers are as prepared to do this as you do. I believe in you. You can do this. I know you can. There's nobody better prepared. And we are the cockroaches of the education profession. We will survive this. We will. Be. We, we survived World War II. We survived World War I. We survived the civil rights movement. We survived integration. We survived the economic meltdown in 83, in 92, in 2001, in 2008. We will survive this but I don't want to survive. I want to thrive. And the difference between surviving and thriving is the actions we take right now. And nobody's going to remember the B flats and F charts, but they will remember you. They will want to be a teacher because of you. They will want to put their kids in band, choir, and orchestra because of you, because of this moment. You know, uh, we do Sunday movies on my garage door for my neighborhood. And one of my neighbors comes because, you know, Scott, my kids are gonna remember these Sunday movies forever. They won't remember what the movie was, but they're gonna remember it was a unique and special time in their life. Um, they're not gonna remember the this, or the this, or the this, or the this, or the this. They're gonna remember your face and the smile on it and the hope 
and the inspiration and the scowl and the hustle up. We're not gonna take mediocrity today, let's work. They're gonna remember you. You can do this, you can do this. Now don't go yet, we're about to end our webinar on time for the first time in six webinars. A uh, couple things, number one, um, we would like you to share with us um, your feedback and you can do that at scott at scottlang.net. That's scott at scottlang.net. Tell me about these uh, webinars, uh, tell me if you're enjoying and, and whether you're getting a lot uh, out of it. The second thing is we'd like you to refer a friend. If you feel like the content we're producing, the things that we're doing are value, um, it's bpotm.org forward slash referral. bpotm.org forward slash referral. And you're gonna see that on the screen in a minute. The third, and please, if everyone would just share one friend, we could reach and do a whole lot of good in this world. Third thing is, um, we've got an idea and it's be part of the music today, but I need your opinion in the chat box right now. You're gonna give me real time feedback. Um, we have a build your own website program for elementary schools or any and middle schools who start beginners. We are considering adding the ability to do instrument testing, instrument choosing, pitch testing, rhythm testing to the website. Um, if that is something you use and would like, we'd like you to put a yes in a, or a thumbs up in the chat box now. If that is something you don't want or wouldn't use or wouldn't like, um, then put a thumbs down or no. If you would be fine with it being on your website, you just wouldn't use it, then put a thumbs up as well. We wanna make sure that we're doing what you need, but the biggest concern that we're hearing from everyone right now is that how do I test kids? How do I test kids um, in this time and assign them instruments? And we've got a solution figured out. Um, we just wanna make sure it's the right solution and we intend to have it up and ready in the next uh, very immediate future. And that's all I'm gonna say with that. And then finally, um, um, next, week's, uh, next week's webinar is on, drum roll please. It's not a webinar, it's a happy hour. Uh, next Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we are going to gather and be happy. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna whine or complain. We're not gonna talk about what's wrong. We're gonna talk about what's right. Bring your coffee, bring your tea, bring your beer, bring your wine, bring your cocktail, bring whatever you want. But Tuesday, we're gonna send out a referral form and we're gonna host a happy hour for one hour or longer next Friday night via Zoom. Uh, what I'd like from you is to tell me who you'd like me to invite to this happy hour. Who would you like to spend an hour with in our profession and in our world? And I can't promise that I'll get them all or even any of them. Maybe it'll just be this guy sitting by himself. But uh, I have some ideas on some friends I'm gonna ask to join and spend some time with us. Uh, but it is a happy hour, not just an hour with a beverage, happy. We're gonna be happy, 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 as my friends from Duck Dynasty would say. Next Friday night, April 23rd at 8 p.m., an evening of chit chat with friends. Hey, Scott. Yes. Hey, of course, uh, next Friday is May 1st. Not April 23rd, but that's okay. Wow. See, that's why Andrew's the smart guy. Um, thank you, Andrew. Next May 1st. I don't catch all the mistakes. That's why we need people like Andrew in my life. Hey, that, that, one other thing people noticed, uh, I thought you knew this the whole time. Your background right now is actually the Bills logo. So when you were looking over your shoulder uh, at your bookcase for your heroes uh, um, thing, people can't see it. People can just see the Bills. <laughs> You're kidding. Well, so here's how that happened. I'll just tell you, my son and I watched the draft last night and I have a little flag football team. And, um, and he was Zooming with my flag football team. We did a draft party and he must have changed my background, which I did not know. So this has been a heck of a webinar. <laughs> uh, we're gonna stop sharing now. Remember in the chat box, um, we want you to share um, who you'd like me to invite to the next webinar. We'd like you to invite, um, we'd like you to um, tell me whether you're up for us modifying a web page. And more than anything, we want you to use bpotm.org. That's bpotm.org forward slash referral um, for referring a friend with us. And since it's over my shoulder, go Bills! Get a good draft pick today and let's do good things. I'm gonna stop the recording. I'm gonna stop the sharing right now. And uh, thank you all for one and all for all that you do. And I'll stick around for just a few minutes in the chat room and answer any questions. Uh, but thank you, good luck and have a fantastic weekend and we will talk soon. Mm -hmm.